Welcome to our first, our first Baptist Church of Pro City, Palm Sunday. How are we doing today? For, you, for those of you in person, welcome, welcome, welcome. For those of you joining online, we are glad that you joined us online. We have a lot in store for this week as we're building up to Easter. This Friday, our church will be closed in, in, in remembrance of Good Friday. And next week, Sunday, we will have three services, an 8 o'clock service, a 9.15 service, and a 10.45 service. The 9.15 service is going to be in person only. So don't be <laughs> looking for it online. It's just an in-person service only. 8 o'clock and 10.45, we also have online services as well. And kids, get ready and get excited because we're going to have an Easter egg hunt, one at 10.20 and one at 10.30. So go find it, those eggs. Following that Easter hunt, we're going to have a 1045 Children's Church. So if you have any questions about that, please email or call Pastor Rob. These are, these are all the updates on our social media pages. So continue to check back www.fbcprocity.com and our Facebook and Instagram. But right now, let's just continue in worship.
morning. Before we enter into the Lord's Supper, let's prepare ourselves spiritually. Let us invite the Holy Spirit to become as one before our Lord. Let's bring worship to the one who gave up the heavens to become man just so he could fulfill the prophets and rescue us from our sins. Come clean, and repent of your sins. Confess and ask for forgiveness. I want you to pray with deep sense of humility. Make it be a time of self-examination. I'll leave you in silence to prepare yourself. 
I'll read your scripture from Psalm 132.7. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Let us pray. Close your eyes and let us pray. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, precious Heavenly Father, let us bow humbly before you at this time where we are about to receive communion. May we gaze upon your beauty. Let us receive your bread and juice with humility, knowing you are present with us, but also acknowledging that you made our redemption possible by your own precious blood and life. We ask for your blessing on our communion, Lord, and to receive it for your glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Jesus calls his followers to come out from the world and to gather in his name. You know, we do so at his invitation. So therefore, let our thoughts be centered upon him and on the sacrifice he made for us all who accept his grace. You know, now this morning, this, this Palm Sunday morning, you know, it's a compelling day to observe the Lord's Supper. You see, thousands of people had heard, you know, of this great prophet that 2,000 plus years ago who entered the city of Jerusalem to observe the Passover. You know, they heard of his, the wisdom of his words as well as the, the acts of his hands. And the following days after he entered the city of Jerusalem, you know, Jesus taught in the temple court, stirring up jealous, envious anger from the religious leaders. But he also was frustrated and, and angry, you know, as there were those in the outer courts of the temple, disgracing the temple. But later that week, on that Thursday, he assembled his disciples in a room to observe what he knew would be his last meal with them. And it was on that night Jesus told them, a new covenant I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. This is what we observe as the Lord's Supper, and, and we do so in remembrance of Christ Jesus, our Lord. So as we partake in the elements, I want to ask you to grab your communion cups here. And, and some of you at home may be using other elements, but, but I, I want to ask you to, to pull back the top layer. You know, it's... You know, if you're like me, this is quite confusing, and, and, and so I had to practice a few times. But if you pull back the top layer, and you can pull out the wafer. You know, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
you know, now as we partake in this next part, you know, I'm going to ask you to peel back the, the next layer. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks this morning, God, for the privilege of being able to come and to, to partake in these elements. But most of all, we give you thanks for the sacrifice you made. And so we observe this practice. We, we partake in it, God, in remembrance of you. We lift it up in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. It's wonderful to see all of you here today. And for all of y'all that are watching at home, it's good to see y'all out there too. Now, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm the Associate Minister of Children here at First Baptist Church, Pearl City. But I'm also one of the campus ministers over at Hawaii Baptist Academy. And one of my duties at Hawaii Baptist Academy is I lead grade level camps about once a month. Well, at least up to a year ago. Um, I have done, and I count them, I have done 127 camps, one a month, and each camp has about 100 kids, and every time we go to camp, one of the very first things I do, no, the very first thing that I do, is we have a safety briefing, because these kids can do anything crazy in a split second, it's amazing. So I gather them all together, and I used to just tell them the rules, be like, okay, don't play football over there, um, don't jump out of the swings, you know, things like that. Did they pay any attention to me? No, okay? They just did whatever they wanted to do, and, well, so after thinking about this for a while, I figured I'm going to change this up a little bit. Instead of just telling them the rules, I'm going to tell them some stories. It's like, okay. You see this area over here where I'm telling you not to play football? The reason that I'm telling you that is that, well, his name was Caleb. And Caleb was playing football over there, and he was running to catch a pass, and he jumped up, he caught the ball, and he landed on a cactus over there because there's a lot of cactuses over there. And when Caleb came down, he was covered in cactus spines, and he couldn't even see very well. It looked like a tree that he put his hand on to lift himself up, and that was a barrel cactus. And all those spines went right into his hands. And the good news is, though, it only took the ambulance about 10 minutes to get there. And so I tell that story, and the kids don't play football over there anymore. It, it kind of works out. And so I've learned that by working with students and working with others, a lot of times people will learn better just by telling them a story. And today, I'm going to tell you a story about the last week of Jesus' life. It's a story of joy and jealousy. It's a story of truth and treason. And I'm not the best storyteller ever, but it's the greatest story ever told. Now, I want you to imagine this. It is Passover time in Jerusalem. This is one of the five major feasts that they have, and it's the biggest of all five. People are going to come from Western Europe, from Persia, from Northern Africa, all to get together in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And what is the Passover? Well, it's the annual remembrance of when God provided the people in Egypt the path out and going to the promised land. And so in Jesus' time, that was about 2,500 years earlier, every single year they worship the Passover. It is really a big deal. And the people that are in charge of all the Passover festivities, <clears throat> excuse me, 
are the Pharisees, Sadducees, experts in the law, and of course the chief priest himself. Now these people may be putting on a festival, but these are not the most festive people that we have. These are people that get their satisfaction by exercising control over other people. These people are similar to a lady that I met in Kentucky a number of years ago. I was speaking at a church at night on uh, spiritual gifts. And after everything's over and everybody's kind of chatting, this lady comes up to me and she's like, hey, preacher, I already know what my spiritual gift is. I'm like, really? What is your spiritual gift? She says, my gift is pointing out sin in other people. <laughs> okay. And I just wanted to back away from this person uh, because that's not a gift. There's not a lot of love just going around and telling people what's wrong with them. You see, these religious leaders are people that would have a set fee for coming to your house to pray. Or they would have a set fee to lead a funeral. And they expected to have the best seats. They expected to be first in line. Imagine, if you would, that you're getting ready to take a trip to the mainland. And you splurge. You go for the first class tickets on Delta from here to Atlanta. Those are nice. And suppose you pay it and you go onto the plane and somebody is occupying your seat. And you would say, excuse me, but this is my seat. And they would just look at you and say, no, I'm sitting here. You go sit back there somewhere. That's the kind of attitude that these people would have had. You know, when I was a pastor up in Wahiwa, I had a family call me one time and say, um, our mom died and we need a preacher to lead the funeral. How much do you charge? So far, the lowest amount we have is $100. Do you charge less than that for a funeral? And I, I could not believe my ears that these people have been calling around the churches to find out how much it would cost just to have a preacher speak at a funeral. No person that pastors a church, I can't imagine anything like that. These experts in the law believe that if a person had any misfortune or illness, it was because of their own sinfulness. And they were like a political party that held authority over the temple. <clears throat> they got to say who was allowed in and who was not good enough to come in. They worked with the occupying Roman army to maintain the control over the people to make them do whatever they wanted them to do. You know, when we talk about these Pharisees and these Sadducees, we're talking about envy, we're talking about jealousy, we're talking about entitlement, we're talking about pride in the worst possible ways. And we're going to see how this is going to lead to conflict. And that leads us to our story today. And our story gets way more interesting because Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem, as Pastor Sterling mentioned a few minutes ago, the original Palm Sunday. Now, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 19, Luke 19, starting in verse 36. Luke 19, starting in 36. And it says, as Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem, people spread their cloaks out on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You know, as Jesus approached the city, there was this parade of people along with him. You see, Jesus' ministry had been one of continuous demonstration of God's power. The deaf speak, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the gospel is preached. The people had never heard or seen anything like Jesus. This was a singularly unique event. And people thought that maybe he could be the one that's going to free the Jews from the occupying Roman army. Maybe he is the man that can save us from all of our troubles. And they welcomed Jesus in the highest honor as he came into the city. And they spread their cloaks on the ground so that not even the donkey he's on would have to touch the dirt. And they're singing this song that comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 118. And a, better, a fuller context would be in Psalm 118, verse 25 through 7. 
Lord, save us. And that is the word Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. And these people's joy is just overwhelming as he is coming into the city. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Hope is here. Yeah, but not so fast. You know, there's, there always seems to be some fuddy-duddy out there who doesn't want to see other people having fun or enjoying themselves. In Luke chapter 19, verse 39, Luke 19, 39, it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. You see, these people hate Jesus. They absolutely hate him. The more good that he does, the more they hate him. Have you ever met anyone that has a hate derangement condition? This is when somebody hates another person so much that it will impair their own judgment. And as I said, I work with a lot of children and have been doing it for a while. And sometimes the kids will come into my office at the school to talk. And one of the things that really causes or disturbs them is when mom and dad want to get divorced. And sometimes divorces can be very mean and be very dirty. And sometimes parents will fight over an object or a pet or even a child, not so much because they want it, but they want to make sure that their spouse does not. And that's a horrible thing for a kid to go through. I remember there was a story in the mid-80s when I was living in California, how this woman and her husband were having a very nasty divorce. And he had moved out of the house, and apparently he had a car that he left at the house. And he told his wife, I just want you to just sell the car, keep half of the money, and just give me the other half, okay? And so she did. And what the car was, was it was a turbo Porsche. It was about a $150,000 car. She sold it for $1. Next time she saw him, she tossed him two quarters and says, that's your share. You know? This insane hatred of Jesus gets even more intense as he enters the city of Jerusalem. Now, one of, the tradi- one of the traditions when you enter into Jerusalem for Passover is to go directly to the temple and to offer a sacrifice. And so the usual sacrifice would depend upon your own social status. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wealthy people would bring in an ox or a sheep or maybe a goat. Uh, Poor people would bring in a dove or a pigeon or something like that. And, of course, gold and silver is always welcome. But there are rules when you sacrifice at the temple. Whatever animal you brought cannot be blind or lame or maimed in any way. In other words, no three-legged goats. If you brought money, it had to be temple money. Now, temple money is different from the regular uses of money. Um, It would be very much like, I got a quarter right here with George Washington's profile on it. And in Jesus' day, the common coin was something similar to this, but it had uh, Tiberius Caesar's portrait on it. And see, you cannot bring that into the temple because anything like that is considered idolatry, okay? It was almost considered blasphemy. And to have a coin with idolatrous symbolism on it Oh, that could get you kicked out the temple. That could cause, you know, further actions than that because you just don't do that. And then there's a thing as a exchange rate when you get to the temple. Uh, You know, if you've ever traveled to Japan or China, you're always looking for the best exchange rate before you go over there because you know that, you know, if you don't, you're just going to get ripped off on all kinds of things. Well, in these booths that are set up in the temple area, for all this trading, exchanging, well, you would have to exchange your money for temple money. And that was a very high exchange rate. And guess what? You can't find another rate because there's only one place that you can do this. And they could charge whatever they wanted. And what they're doing is they're ripping people off. Or suppose you bring in a pigeon. And you come in, your pigeon is going to have to be inspected. And so one of these 
rulers would take your pigeon and look at it, and they would find something wrong with it and say, this has got a blemish on it. It's got a mark right here. How dare you bring something like this into the temple to offer God? How dare you? And you would be like, hey, I, I didn't know that. Um, but I have to offer something. I don't know what to do. And people will say, well, you know what? We got some pre-approved pigeons right over here. Let me get you one of these. So I will give you this pigeon if you give me your pigeon and 20 bucks. Okay? And so you would make the exchange. You would pocket the money. The pigeon that you just gave him would probably go back to be sold to the next person. And don't forget these booths that you have in the temple. This is kind of like uh, flea markets or swap meet. That you just can't go over to the swap meet and set up your own little booth. No, 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 no. You've got to rent that booth. And there's going to be rules and regulations. And money's going to be changing hands here. And this is how some money gets to the chief priest. Through all this buying and selling. And Jesus sees this going on, and it rightfully angers him. And in Luke chapter 19, 45 through 30, 48, it says, When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find a way to do it because all the people hung on his words. And this is that hate derangement that I was talking about, just pure and simple. There is now a plot to destroy Jesus. But there is one complicating factor. And that factor is Jesus' popularity. The leadership is convinced that Jesus has just got to go. But they're not certain how to do this. They don't have the power to destroy him on their own. So what they do is they try to trick him. In Luke chapter 20, verse 20 and following, Luke 20, verse 20, it says, Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. You know, if they could just get Jesus to talk stink about the Roman government or anything connected with it, they could call out the cops on him, so to speak. And talk and stink about the Roman government, oh, that's punishable, maybe even punishable by death. So here's what they did. It was really quite clever. So the spies questioned Jesus. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Hmm. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So first of all, they butter him up a little bit by saying how wonderful he is. And then they think they can just slam him with a question that is going to destroy him no matter how he answers. He's only got two options and neither one of them is good. First of all, I don't know about you, but I've never really met anybody that really enjoys paying their taxes. And maybe you can remember back to your very first part-time job. Mine was at Arby's Roast Beef. And, you know, you have to work two weeks before you get your first paycheck. And, you know, I'm working 20 hours a week. For two weeks, that's 40. I was making, I think it was around $5 an hour. So I'm thinking, let's see here, 40 by 5. Ooh, my first check's going to be $200. This is going to be awesome. It's time to go out and party. You know, that kind of thing. Well, you finally get your paycheck and you realize that the federal government, the state government, and the city government has already reached in there and helped themselves. So what I thought was going to be about $200 was closer to about $120. And I'm like, hey, where's the rest of it? And maybe y'all don't remember that, but hey. But with the Roman government, the Roman occupied Israel, they took a lot more, a lot more. And it was punitive for them, and they would just take whatever they could. They're in charge. They can do it, so they did. So if Jesus says, pay taxes to Caesar, his popularity is just going to cease. However, if he says, don't pay taxes to Caesar, he can be arrested and punished. And punished. They got him. They got him. Or so they think. But Jesus doesn't 
play their little game. Sorry. So check out what he does. The scripture says, he saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius. Now, I want you to think about how this happened. Jesus is surrounded by hundreds of people. And these people are coming up to him, and everyone's hanging on his answer. What is he going to say? And Jesus gives an answer that's, what? Show me a denarius. One of these experts in the law probably reaches in whatever he has for a pocket and goes, yeah, what? Now imagine, it's got Tiberius Caesar on it. These experts in the law are breaking the law of the temple. That is idolatry. Now you can just imagine everybody looking at the guy's hand and going, ha, 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 you know, just flip the situation totally upside down. And Jesus just nails him with the question. <clears throat> Whose image and inscription are on that? And they have no choice but just to say, Caesar's. And so, Jesus says to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. They don't want to get laughed at anymore. So these religious officials, these people who are supposed to be the most honorable people in the world, go for two other tactics lying and bribery. They bribed one of the disciples named Judas Iscariot to lead them to Jesus when he is away from the crowds. And that's what happened. But see, you have to remember, none of this was a surprise to Jesus. He knew what was going to happen in the next 24 hours because it was for these next few hours that he had been sent to humanity to pay the ransom for our sins. He went through the mockery of five different trials and they still could not get a guilty verdict on him. They broke their own laws in their courts just to get him. They wanted him dead, and they didn't care what they had to do to get it. So they whipped up a mob with a bunch of lies to the point that they're creating a riot with people shouting out, crucify him, crucify him. Even Pontius Pilate, his last Roman judge said, I find no fault in this man. But the crowd prevailed. In Matthew chapter 20, 27, Verse 24 says, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And with that, they took him away. And they beat him with canes. They beat him with whips that had broken sheep bones and iron balls embedded in the tails so that they could literally tear him apart. After the flogging, Jesus was probably already in critical condition. But they still made him carry the cross, or the crossbar of the cross, on his shoulder to the site of the execution. The crossbar would weigh probably between 75 and 100 pounds. And he collapsed on the way. Another person had to carry it for him. When they got to the hill, known as Golgotha, they nailed him to a cross, flipped it up in the air. And then the religious leaders would come up to him and spit on him and curse at him, possibly slap, punch him, humiliate him in any way that they could. And how did Jesus respond? Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. In that first word, Father, the first word of the prayer that he taught the disciples, our Father who art in heaven. 
that term of endearment, that word that we would probably translate as daddy. Forgive them. They know not what they do. The excruciating pain that was on Jesus was not just the nails, but the pain was the punishment for the weight of all the sins of you and me. All the sins of the world were laid upon him on that cross. About six hours later, he cried out his final words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Again, Father. After he dies, the Romans take a spear and pierce him through the side, through the lung, and into the heart, just to make sure that he's dead. He's removed from the cross and buried in a borrowed tomb. This is the day that we observe as Good Friday. What's good about it? I've been asked that question so many times over the years. What good is it? It's the day that Jesus died. What's good about it? It's the darkest day in all of human history. But see, the greatest beauty came from the greatest darkness. Because in a few days, everything is going to change. People will know that there is far more to life than just our living. People will know the hope of all humankind that death has been conquered. There is more, much more, that trusting in what Jesus accomplished this week will change the word forever. What Jesus did change the world and us individually. What a beautiful name, the name of Jesus. Let's pray, please. Father, thank you for Jesus. And help us to know, Lord, that sometimes when we don't even know how to reach out to you, that we can call out to you, Father. Father, please help. That we can call out, Lord, knowing that you will hear. Thank you for Jesus, Lord, and for all that he accomplished for each of us. Father, thank you for your sacrifice so that we can come before you, Lord, and speak to you. Thank you for showing us eternal life with you and giving us hope, Lord. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
as we close today, may we reflect on what Jesus has done for us. The love that he shows through his blood and the sacrifice that he made for us on that cross. Through Jesus' life, he is born, he, arose, he died, and he arose, and he lives on forever. And that is something for us to celebrate this week as we prepare for Easter. But right now, let's just close in worship with this next song. Let's all 
standing, lift our hands to Jesus. 